Um, my name is Jandia Zubrzycki. I'm Associate Professor of Sociology, Director of CREES, and Director also of the Polish, uh, the Copernicus Polish Program. I can't do it. The Copernicus Program in Polish Studies. I never get it right. Um, and today it's a great honor and a true pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Catherine Verdery, who is the Julian J. Studley Faculty Scholar and Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I had to write it down. Uh, but who remains actually one of us since she was at Michigan for many years, a generous colleague, outstanding teacher and graduate mentor, and also who served as director of CREES. Professor Verdery is certainly the, the most important anthropologist of Eastern Europe. She has published seven books and countless um, articles. Um, and those seven books collectively earn her 11 awards. I hope they were all listed on your CV, but um, that's very impressive. And perhaps even more impressive is the fact that while she's a specialist of Romania, she thinks very broadly about socialism and post-socialism, nationalism, and the state, reaching audiences well beyond disciplinary and geographic boundaries. I'm a sociologist, and when I first my, read my first piece of yours, it inspired me, and she became my <coughs> intellectual idol, actually. Her latest book is entitled Secrets and Truths, Ethnography in the Archive of the Romania Secret, Romanian Secret Police. But today she's presenting for the very first time this avant-première, uh, a chapter of her uh, forthcoming memoir. So the style of the talk will be interestingly different, refreshingly different from um, other types of talks we have had in the past. Her talk's title is An, An, An Anthropology of Romania's Secret Police, but given the autobi autobiography uh, or autobiographical nature of the project, it might even be more accurate to call it an anthropologist's encounters with Romania's secret police. So we look forward to the book, perhaps even to the movie. Um, and please join me in welcoming Professor Verdery. The, um, the title of the memoir that I'm writing is um, um, my life is a spy. <laughs> is this okay? I'm going to move it over this way. So thank you all for coming. This is just wonderful to see so many friends from my uh, uh, much um, regretted in the sense of I wish I hadn't left <laughs> time at Michigan. Um, as uh, Genevieve said, this is uh, going to be a rather different kind of talk from what you've heard from me in the past. Um, my Life as a Spy is uh, based on the, the, um, my acquisition of my secret police file from the Romanian uh, Securitate. Uh, I got it in 2008. Um, I actually didn't read it and all the way through until 2010 because I couldn't, I wasn't sure I wanted to. And uh, I have decided to write this memoir as seen through the eyes of the secret police. Um, you are getting, uh, this is a first draft uh, that I'm giving you of uh, chapter three, a shortened version of chapter three, and it's entitled Betrayals. Um, so this is what my first exposure of this material to um, an audience. And I want uh, to thank Chris for inviting me, um, Donna for doing all the legwork in the most wonderful way, as she always does, uh, Marisha and Genevieve for running such a great operation here and I'm very happy to be among you. I begin with a quote from Romanian philosopher Gabriel Licianu, uh, which from his own memoir, which is entitled My Dear Informer. He uh, constructed it in the form of several letters to the principal informer in his police file. Anyone who comes into contact with the target, that is the person under surveillance, more or less by chance, is at once brought under surveillance, written up, shadowed. Thus, any person on the territory of Romania who becomes a target also becomes radioactive. He irradiates all those with whom he connects. When my friends and colleagues in the U.S. hear about my secret police file, the first question is likely to be, 
So did the police get it right, or did they make up a lot of stuff about you? And did a lot of your friends betray you by informing on you? This latter question leads me to some of the most confusing and painful moments of my encounter with my file and reveals a great deal about what it was like to do field work in a context of secrecy. Okay. <laughs> they know I'm here. <laughs> From 1973 to 1988, that's roughly 15 years of field work during which I spent approximately 40 months in Romania, at least 70 persons in five different locations gave information on me to the Securitate. Many were casual acquaintances who wrote a small number of notes. Some were people I met only in passing, such as ho hotel re uh, receptionists, and some were colleagues and friends, even intimates. Of all these people, only one told me before 1989 that she had been asked to submit reports on me. Partly owing to the childlike subject position anthropologists often uh, occupy in the field, I found myself becoming emotionally attached to a much larger number of people than was true of me in my normal life at home. Although I've always had a proclivity for developing strong attachments, during my field work and especially in the mid-1980s, I exhibited a remarkable emotional promiscuity. This habit left me wide open to being colonized by the Securitate through their use of informers. When they find out I am growing close to someone, they are likely to recruit to try to recruit that person as an informer if he or she is not already in their network. But did these reports amount to a betrayal, as so much public discourse both in the West and in Eastern Europe would have it? So my first uh, example uh, is Moshu. Although I had been unaware of it at the time, discovering that my landlord, Moshu, had been filing regular reports on me during 1974 was not a surprise. He could scarcely have avoided being asked, given his friendships with the commune authorities who often came to drink with him. What surprised me, rather, was the remarkable extent of his reporting. Uh, so um, here's an example. Informer's note. Since our last meeting, him with the officer, 30 April 1974, the American citizen Verdery Catherine Maureen carried on her activity as follows. On 1 May 74, she was at Popa Sabine and Moldovianu Leone. Source, that is, he's referring to himself in the third person, as informers are, are um, asked to do. Uh, source spoke with both of them. She asked Popa Sabine only about his kin. He works as an electrician at Kujir, where there was an armaments factory. He's about 37, 38. She asked him if he's from Vlaiku, to which he replied that he inherited his house from his father-in-law, being himself from Bukainz. He has two sisters, one an engineer and the other at university. Moldovianu Leone is from Moldova, is elderly, deaf, and myopic. He has a daughter by marriage. The American said she couldn't get anywhere with her. <laughs> you know, not everybody's good at field work all the time. <laughs> On the, and just wait. <laughs> On the 2nd of May, 1974, she went to Vaidan Teodor, who cleans up the uh, collective farm stables. He is 74. The American said that he is mentally weak and she couldn't find anything to discuss with him. <laughs> Todoran Nikolai, employee at the armaments factory in Kujir. He is from Balsha, and he was asked when he had come to Vlaiku. On May 3rd, 1974, she went to Vaidan Aurel, brother of Theodor. He used to be a big nationalist. He's about 80 and walks with difficulty. Source spoke with him. He said the American asked him about his kin and whether he is from Vlaiku, end quote. In the rest of this informer note, Moshu went on to report my activities and his follow-up discussions with my respondents for the remaining six days until his next meeting with Officer Paul. Moshu had come with notes. Paul had taped their conversation and then typed it up later. Such meetings were repeated about every 10 days. The previous week, the officer's instructions had been that when the American left home, Moshu should go into her room, see who had written letters to her, and read the ones that were in Romanian, and also observe every day where she went and whom she made contact with. When she came home in the evening, he should discuss with her what she had talked about with them. Thus, he is to know what the American does every single day. 
Another note concerns a party that I threw for my companion in the U.S. who had come to visit me in the field. In Moshu's report of it, he told exactly what we had eaten and listed the names of every single person of the 40 I had invited to the party. Being mentioned on such a list could have repercussions, as, as is evident from a report he filed on 30 August 1974. Quote, I have already informed you that the American took some German lessons from Pro Professor Hellermann of Deva. She told Source that she doesn't know how she managed to live without the professor up to now, so attached has she become to her. Source believes she stayed at their house in Deva on the 21st and 22nd since she did not come home. The officer's note following this, measures, effect a verification of the Hellermanns to see if they submitted their report to the leadership of the units where they work, as is required by law. Contact the said Hellermann to obtain data about her connection with the American citizen. This would not be the Securitate's last pursuit of the Hellermanns. Moshu's reports made it clear that I could not have made a single throwaway line over breakfast or mentioned anyone in passing without my words potentially traveling on to the officer, generally in garbled form. In this way, Moshu helps to make me radioactive, in Li Chanu's words, spreading my contaminating effects more widely. As I read his reports, however, I began to think that after the first month or so, he was not actually talking with everyone he said he was. Maybe he got the gist from the first couple of weeks, then gradually narrowed the topics discussed to, she asked them about kinship. And much though I crin cringed at reading the notes, their cumulative effect was rather to exculpate me of the suspicions for which he had been recruited to inform on me for he repeatedly stated that I had not asked anyone about the armaments factory at Kujir or the work of the people employed there. Because his officer, Pal, was primarily concerned with my spying on military inst installations, such as Kujir, and did not expand his inquiry into other areas when that seemed not to pan out, Moshu contributed a lot to the officer's concluding report that absolved me of my suspected spying for that visit. So was this a betrayal or a service? Moshu had died before I saw my file. I would have liked to talk with him about it. Instead, in 28, I uh, asked his sister-in-law whether she knew he was informing, yes, and how he had felt about it. She observed, he knew which way the wind blew, but he liked you, so he wouldn't have said anything harmful. It didn't bother, bother him much. He liked going to the restaurant on the highway, getting something to eat, having a chance to ogle the waitresses. The reason he'd give for going there was, I'm giving my eyes a rest. The officer always met him at restaurants, and he had a good time. End quote. She didn't believe it had been a terrible burden for him or a source of anxiety. Example two, Silviu. One of my very favorite people from my years in Romania was a middle-aged man whom I will call Silviu. He lived in Deva, and I had met him through my connections in Vlaiku. A warm, soft-spoken man, he became the person I went to first if I had any problems or needed advice. He appeared to have become very fond of me during my first research trip, and I had certainly grown fond of him. Sometimes he hinted that he felt a special kind of communion with me, telling me if I showed up unannounced that he had had a premonition I would come or that I reminded him of a family member very dear to him. True, he did intimate to me several times during those 15 years that he was being harassed by the powers, but implied that he was holding firm. Therefore, I was quite unprepared for what I found in my file. And I'm just sampling a few of his reports. From uh, November 22nd of 1979, in the trips she took in the past, she told me that she visited Kujir, even though there are signs indicating she should not enter. She said that she went there out of curiosity. Uh, 18th of December, 1979. In the discussions I had with Werderi Katerin, this particular officer could never spell my name right, 
I learned that she bought a car worth $4,700 but had great luck with the owner of the firm, who is a Hungarian, and gave it to her for $4,000. That was true, actually. <laughs> Another significant fact from her life is the meeting she had in New York with a history professor of Hungarian origin. She confessed that she liked him very much. The officers note at the end of this one, the present material is the result of tasks assigned and brings new elements of interest concerning the situation of Werderi Katerin, especially along the lines of her relations with Hungarian emigres. As follow-up, the source was instructed to find possibilities to spend as much time as possible in her entourage. Uh, January 15, 1980. After extensive contact with Verdery Catherine, I have formed certain opinions about her activity from the discussions we carried on. I remain of the view that her material situation is not especially good and that she wishes to improve herself from both material and social points of view, being disposed to use any means toward that end. In this sense, he's continuing, I have the opinion, but not the certainty, that she has ties to the Pentagon or CIA. Looking through a book of ours, she showed me a photo of a high functionary from the Pentagon whom she knows. I had met Dan Daniel Ellsberg at a conference. <laughs> <laughs> from the way she behaves, it appears she is only interested in data for her book. But from the information she re receives, she can at any moment serve the U.S. authorities or, persons or other persons with data that are not favorable to us. It is quite possible that her first two trips to Romania might be simply preparation for the real work she plans to do. In another report, he alleges that despite my claim not to know the Hungarian language, the officer um, adds he has the impression that she knows Hungarian but pretends she doesn't so as to mislead. Um, uh, July 26, 1982. Officers report with proposal to penetrate and effect a secret search of target Vera, which was uh, one of my uh, pseudonyms. This person holds at her domicile documents and notes concerning her research to date. A secret search of the target's domicile is indicated with photocopying is indicated uh, for photocopying of the documents she holds there. Toward this end, action will be taken through Silviu, who will invite her to visit the towns of Orestia and Deva. Their trip will be verified by nonstop shadowing. While the foreigner is away from her dom domicile, Lieutenant Colonel Krachun Viorel and Lieutenant Colonel Lung Vasile, with the permission of her host, a source for our organs, will search the foreigner's possessions and copy her documents, which they did. Of all the informer's reports in my file, these enraged and distressed me the most. Underlining indicates what the officers were excited to find, and it was coming from someone with impeccable credentials as a person of integrity and good judgment. He presents me as a liar, since all the research I'm doing is simply a cover for something else. He repeats the falsehood that I had gone to Kujir, with its military installation, out of curiosity. I didn't go there. <laughs> he insinuates my supposed Hungarian identity repeatedly. Here is the Securitate's nightmare come true, that I am an agent of the Hungarian diaspora who will denigrate Romania and tarnish its image in the world. Moreover, Silviu states outright that he suspects me of being an intelligence agent, and he comes up with justifications for his view. His final report in 1980, as I read it, sees me having prepared for the intelligence coup I am now ready to carry out. He then assists the officers in conducting a search of my room. The first time I read these very hastily in June uh, 2008, I was furious and hurt, but I did not have time to sit and read them closely. I simply came away with the sense that these were very damning informer's reports from a man I had loved. I was on my way to David to see him that same summer when I learned that he was exceedingly ill. Indeed, he died a month later. A conversation with him about his reports would be difficult. From my field notes, 7th of June, um, 2008. About 4.30 p.m., I phone his house. His wife is sobbing. He's doing much worse, mostly sleeps. When I hang up, I start to cry. General feeling of desolation. 
Yesterday, I lay down for a nap. Huge buzz in my head. It had to be that loud to drown out my feelings of terrible loss. Image of a large howling mouth and an echo that I fear will never stop if I let it start. Then, Silvio, how could you? How could you? Crying, fighting against crying, against the feeling of betrayal. Can't say that. He must have had his reasons. But that's no reason for, for me not to feel betrayed. Not long after Silvio's death, I talk with his son, not letting on that I've read my file. I say I'm about to and am expecting some surprises. He replies evenly, I wouldn't be surprised if my dad is in there. He was a very fearful man. He'd give in if he thought it necessary. His past was full of reasons to be afraid. He had many qualities, but courage was not among them. Without going into the extenuating circumstances we then discussed, I would add that the officer uh, who worked with him, Lieutenant Colonel Belgiu, quite possibly provided or dictated some or all of Sylvie's reports for him to sign, rather than the other way around. This was common enough, and I know from Benjamin, another informer used by Officer Belgiu, that he had proceeded in a similar way in Benjamin's case asking him for his observations and then systematizing them in his own rather different language. With these thoughts, I struggle to bring Silvio back by divesting him of the ugly and damaging things he wrote and attributing them instead to his officer. But this resolution is precarious. I'm subject to revisiting it for years thereafter. How could he have presented himself to me so affectionately and then written such injurious rubbish? How should I understand my relations with him? Was he entirely put up to it, or was this the price he had to pay in order to express his affection? So many unanswered questions. The next section is entitled On Friendship and Betrayal. <clears throat> These examples would seem to constitute betrayals of relationships with various friends who either were already working for the Securitate when they met me or agreed to do so thereafter. Certainly, upon reading these reports, I felt betrayed, as is evident from my image of the howling mouth and my asking, how could you? Reading my file had many such moments, though most of them were not as ex extreme as this with Silvio, because my feelings of trust in him were especially great, and I thought they were reciprocal. Because other people saw him as a pers person of unusual integrity, I had convinced myself he was. And that would mean his not making outrageous claims to the Securitate about me, the most damaging claims of anyone who informed. But were my expectations appropriate? Was our relationship sufficient for me to think of this as a betrayal? Let us consider following the work of Italian sociologist Gabriella Turnaturi in her book Betrayals, that betrayal can occur only in relationships marked by prior relations of loyalty based on previously established trust. Otherwise, there is no betrayal. What is important is the relationship rather than the other person. This perspective enables placing the relation between me and my informer in the context of all that person's other relationships, rather than focusing on the informer and me as two individuals, one betraying the other. In my view, betrayal also requires that one or both parts perceive it or understand it as such. Therefore, if I discern from my friend's behavior that she is abandoning our relationship, I have a choice. I can define it as a betrayal or as her having been overwhelmed by a greater exigency to which I was insignificant. This is easier done if I can maintain my focus on the idea of betrayal as her abandoning not me myself, but our relationship, at least for the time. Perhaps that attitude will enable me to resume the relation should my friend retur return to it or act as if she had never left for the abandonment occurred in secret. In other words, the trick for me is to refuse to define the apparent abandonment as a betrayal. For that to happen, I must drop my all too Western tendency to think largely in terms of autonomous individuals. My relations with various Romanians who have arguably broken my trust have to be placed in the context of the larger set of relationships in which they are embedded, relations that these people may be protecting when they agree to inform on me. For me to see their abandonment as betrayal would be to insist that I be more important to them than those others. 
put the, to put the problem in this way is to diminish the force of betrayal. For clearly it is absurd, absurd for me to imagine that I will be more important to my friends than their own families will. Um, relations having much greater longevity for them than does ours. Here the difference in the circumstances, not to mention the cultural understandings of anthropologist and local friend, is crucial to thinking about whether or not our informers betrayed us. I developed a number of close friendships in the field, investing perhaps an inordinate amount, a, a number of them with strong attachment, and I believe that many, if not most, of my Romanian friends were happy to know me. Indeed, many people I met seemed positively drawn to me, in part because I represented America and freedom, and in part because I worked hard to be appealing. Even the officers noted this, observing that I was good at forming connections. But my companions' definitions of friendship and trust differed rather from mine. Hardly a surprise, given the superficiality of what counts as friendship in the U.S., where you can become best buddies with someone through a brief encounter or now a click on a Facebook page. Romanians often commented to me that Americans have too shallow an understanding of friendship. A couple of conversations, a sense of interpersonal charisma, and hey presto, a new friend. Not so in Romania, especially not in socialist Romania or other East European countries of those times. First, much more of the work of organizing intimacy there comes from kinship relations that begin at birth, and after that from native place, school, occupational, or workplace ties likely to be of long duration. Second, friendship as an alternative basis for social connection develops over a long time, often within the framework of those other ties. It takes years, especially under socialism, of testing another's trustworthiness in tiny increments before that person can truly be called a friend. And once tested, a person might as easily be assimilated into the category of kin rather than friend. For me, my friend Maria Lucivu became a beloved friend, but her way of expressing it is to say that I'm like a daughter to her, just as my friend Maria Lurelu often says that I'm as good to her as a sister. I remember two moments in my beginning to see how Romanian friendship might be different from what I thought friendship was. One was a day I had spent hanging out with a woman I'd known for some time and found very amusing and informative. As I went home, I found myself saying, I never thought I could utter the sentence, X is a good friend and I don't trust her, but here I am saying it. The second occurred one day in Cluj when I had unexpectedly come into possession of a huge quantity of fresh cucumbers, which were almost impossible to find in the stores then. I went around to all the people I had hung out with in Cluj that year to give them cucumbers, until I was brought up short by one woman who said, why are you bringing these to us? You should be using them for your obligations. With this, she subdivided my uniform category of friend into two categories, casual acquaintances with whom I should be creating reciprocal obligations through gift giving, and people with whom I had a more soulful relation that I did not have to prove. I had been lumping them together. At the same time, however, for an American who takes warm and hospitable behavior as evidence of friendship rather than as a performance of personhood to which gift giving and reciprocity are central, which I think is a better description, it is easy to feel rather quickly that one has a lot of friends there because so many Romanians have a wonderful capacity for making an intense connection that feels like friendship to someone like me, a connection we would expect to support relations of trust. But to invest trust in these relations too quickly is to risk disappointment, not because the people are untrustworthy, but because the relationship may still be too young and the social world around it too perilous. Their history as Romanians has ravaged the sense of predictability that underlies trust, a precious and fragile relationship the Securitate assaulted in the most deliberate manner. For instance, in a 1985 document in my file, they write, our organs must take special measures to interrupt her trust relations. The possibilities for trust kept shifting throughout my work, affecting the prospects for betrayal. In the 1970s, things were much looser than in the 1980s when pressures on people to inform became much greater, 
and the likelihood of trustworthiness diminished. These circumstances chained, changed the terrain of relating for all of us, subjecting earlier settled trust to new trials. My friendship with the Hellermans, for instance, which had deepened from our meeting in 1974 on into the next decade, was profoundly tested when, in 1986, two Securitate officers came to their weekend house in the country, put him in their car, and drove away, leaving his wife to wait in rising panic for several hours. The officers took him to a field far from other houses and told him that I was about to be arrested for extreme treachery, and if he refused to inform on me, then he would be arrested as an accomplice. He refused, and they took him home. I doubt that these friends' trust in me would have been subjected to such an ordeal a few years before. This um, next section is called My Betrayals. Given how little I understood about Romania, the irrepressible and highly responsive person I became in the field made me a danger, a source of betrayals of my own. Considering, consider the following report from a man I had met while copying documents at the notary's office. After working with him for several weeks, weeks during which we had begun to flirt a bit, we went, went out for a beer and flirted some more. Then I offered to drop him at his house en route to my next visit, asking him if he knew the location of the building where I was going next, because I didn't. In my superficial way, I felt that he and I were becoming friends, so I told him whom I was going to visit, thereby breaking the cardinal rule for foreigners in Cold War Romania, never mention one friend to another, unless you are certain that they know each other and you have their permission. His report concerning me covers two closely typed pages, among which is this paragraph. Ms. Verdery has a motorbike on which I went to the gauged quarter of town to, he gives the address, she told me that in that building live her friends, the Schilling family. I don't recall the name exactly. The case officer's subsequent report corrects the final sentence. She went to the Hellermann family, with whom action will be taken in the manner ordered by the le leadership of Service 3, espionage. So what on earth possessed me to give these people's names to someone I hardly knew? I was a loose cannon with this kind of carelessness, the closer I grew to the Hellermans and others like them, the more dangerous I became to them. Uh, now, this section is called Professor David Prodan. Uh, he has been introduced in an earlier chapter. Uh, and here I will just say he was a very uh, important elderly historian of Transylvania with whom I developed a loving friendship. By 1980, I was ready to turn my 1977 dissertation into a book, the manuscript of which was quite different from my thesis. I took a draft of it to Professor Prodan when I went to Romania briefly in 1982, and he gave it to his colleague who knew English. It passed this reading as, quote, favorable to us, note this criterion for scholarly work, and to the Transylvanian peasant, end quote, as well as a reasonably accurate history. In an excess of enthusiasm for what I had accomplished, however, I decided to advertise its main theme by means of two jokes, which I placed in the front of the book. They showed identical ethnic stereotypes of Hungarians, Germans, and Romanians in 1880 and 1980, separated by a century. In all the Romanian jokes of this type, of which there are many, the Hungarians always come off as hot-headed and violent, the Germans as miserly and calculating, and the Romanians as thieves. I didn't think anyone came off well. I thought the two jokes would be a concise way of stating the problem of the book. How could ethnic ideas have remained so much the same, even as their environment evolved from feudalism to capitalism to socialism? That I was pleased with my solution shows just how little I had learned in the field about ethnic sensibilities, or even about the basic truth that an outsider can never tell an ethnic joke without deeply offending the people in question, even if it is a joke they often tell themselves. I can try to excuse myself in various ways, but the bottom line was that my sense of intellectual superiority had led me to publish a book with two jokes in the front that every last Romanian saw as my view of their character, not as the problem of the book, and at which they took violent offense. 
This mistake reve revealed great sensitivity and lack of judgment on my part, and it ruined my relations with many Romanian intellectuals. As is clear from numer numerous Securitate officers' reports, it also damaged my relations with the Securitate of the city of Cluj, where I would uh, carry out most of my research in the 1980s. For instance, document from the Ministry of the Interior, Cluj County Inspectorate, top secret, December 1984. Report concerning Vera. Verdery Catherine, 36 years of age, professor in the anthropology department of John Hopkins University, came to Romania in August 1984 to effect a sociological study concerning the way in which national history is reflected in the consciousness of the Romanian people. The above named also effected research in our country in 1974 and 79 80, publishing in the USA in 1983 a book about Transylvanian villages from the 18th to 20th centuries, in general positive, but in which certain mottos make insulting judgments against the remaining people. We propose to interrupt her stay in this country. The highest price I paid for those jokes, however, was the devastation they wrought upon my tender relationship with Professor David Prodan, whom I refer to in the, what follows as DP. He was absolutely livid at the inevitable repercussions I had brought upon myself, at the embarrassment to him, since others knew he had been supporting my work, and at the injury to his own deep national pride. He had found out about the jokes before I arrived for my 1984 research trip. His reception when I showed up on a hot August day was, to understate the case, chilly. Field Journal, August 1984. Flap over reception of book makes me feel crappy. Both self-critical and pissed at others for reading only the headings, not the book, and then making judgments. DP's criticism really stings. Self-criticism and self-defense together make an unpleasant atmosphere. A few days later, I am preoccupied with the thought that DP is upset with me. I explain it as owing to the jokes or perhaps to my having pissed him off in some other way. His wife says, no, he's just preoccupied with his work. Nonetheless, he is definitely withdrawn. September 1984, ongoing argument with DP reduced me to tears, reaffirmed my sense of being a bad ethnographer and maybe mad, made me mad at him and at Romanians in general for being so sensitive and at Hungarians and history for making them thus. December 28, 1984, went to DP's to tell him about Horia conference and got into same old fight, weeping. It seems he is irreparably wounded by my insult. After about four months, he finally decided to forgive me, but that didn't go for some in his entourage of colleagues and friends. Defending both him and their own sense of insult, they chided me over and over. Why did I have to write something like that? It will bring me under even greater surveillance. It's offensive, and on and on. I had countless discussions on this theme. Beginning in September, with all this quarreling and chastisement, I stopped being able to sleep and was driven to take lessons in meditation, to help me continue my work. The question of the jokes could resurface even years later. In 2012, a friend from the Academy Library where I had worked described for a documentary film the effect of my jokes on his own hitherto close relations with Prodan. He had been the one assigned to read the manuscript and clear it for the professor. The manuscript he saw did not have the jokes. Quote, I told the professor that the views in the book don't conform to the official views, but the book is full of genuine love for the Romanian peasant. But after the book came out, a lot of tension developed around it. Someone convinced the professor that it was my fault for not telling him about the mottos. He didn't speak to me for six months in reproach. My decades-long relation with Professor Prodan had collapsed. For six months, I suffered like a dog until you came and cleared things up, saying there were no mottos then. This is our weak spot in the east of Europe. You can make fun of your own people, but no one else has the right to do so. With all this damage and upheaval in people's relationships on my account, it seems absurd to insist that the people who informed on me betrayed me. Rather, as our relations deepened, my associates and I betrayed one another, sometimes knowingly and sometimes not, sometimes shaped by ignorance or circumstance or sheer thoughtlessness. 
In my case, the ignorance came partly from the Cold War system of international relations, which had so cramped my knowledge of what went on behind the Iron Curtain, and partly from my dismissing the U.S. Embassy's warnings about surveillance as just being their Cold War mentality. The Cold War had also made leaders of Soviet bloc countries anxious about the negative image of socialism that people like me could propagate in the West. They kept watch over us to prevent that. And the Cold War had politicized the question of the satellite country's national images as well, sharpening sensitivities to possible slights to the national character. In a bipolar world with superpowers and unhappy client states, both the image of socialism and the question of one's national image became matters of national security. And the Securitate was there to protect that. While still laboring toward this conclusion, in summer 2012, I launched a conversation about informers with my Bucharest friend, Silvia. What position should I take towards them? I say I'm hoping I can get some informers to talk with me. She replies, they're ashamed, implying that my sample might not be large. I say I don't feel I have the right to judge because I wasn't put in the situation my informers were in. I'm not from here, and I didn't have the officers compelling me to inform. Sylvia objects. I find this a stupid opinion. <laughs> of course you have the right to judge. You spent a lot of time here. You've had a significant engagement with this country, and people did this to you, some of it quite harmful. In 21st century Romania, informing remains an urgent moral question. Now, in this last uh, brief section, um, I'm reporting the transcript of, a, of eavesdropping on telephone conversation. And um, if you've ever wondered what it's like to overhear on a telephone what other people think your research is about, and like, it's not fun. <laughs> okay. So, telephone intercept, 19 to 20 June 1987 transcribed by Captain F.I. with occasional comments, T.N., transcriber's note. F. and G. are discussing how to get me to agree to translate G.'s latest book into English. I've already refused once. The book is two fat volumes totaling over 700 pages, but they're plotting a new strategy. Then they turn to talking about me and my work. F. I have the impression that the ethnography she does translator's note, she hesitates, looking for a word that will not be too unfavorable, picks and chooses from a number of domains without going into depth in the European style. I don't know if this is good or bad, but I've seen, like with her discussion of philosophy, three words from here, four from there. G, pretty much. Probably it's an excellent instrument for informing the public over there, because she synth synthesizes things admirably, you know. F, yes. G, it's just that it's as if taken from an airplane. I won't tell her that, of course, though she's asked me to give her my opinion. I'll tell her there's a lot more one could say. F, before she focused on older stuff, probably sh she's continuing up to the present. Who knows? But in any case, she's very intelligent. Transcriber's note, yes. <laughs> 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 and it would be great if, transcriber's note, F breathes deeply if she loved us. If she loved us, here in a nutshell was my dilemma among Romanian intellectuals. Despite Ceausescu's efforts to isolate the country from Western currents, Romania had first class thinkers like F and G, deeply familiar with their own ethnographic tradition, very different from that of the US, and far better read than I in European history, literature, and philosophy. Plagued, however, by the dilemma, by the stigma of belonging to a small country surrounded by bigger, more aggressive, and important ones, they hungered for recognition by powerful outsiders. Beyond this, they were extraordinarily sensitive to anything that might appear as a slight. Alongside all the Seku officers who wanted to influence me in a positive direction were scholars like F and G, who wanted me to delve more thoroughly into what they saw as their own worthy intellectual tradition and to become their partisans in a larger world, to love them, to bring their work to an English-speaking public, to help them make the leap from their own modest stage to a larger one. Instead, 
I was a disappointment, both great and small. Small because I did this kind of superficial e ethnography from an airplane and declined to translate their work, which would do me no good in my quest for tenure in a competitive U.S. academic environment. Great because I put those offensive disparaging jokes in the front of my book. People's memory for such affronts was very long. In 2011, I re-encountered for the first time after 27 years a well-known Bucharest historian, Florin Constantiniu, who had been asked in 1984 to recommend my 1983 book for translation. He'd refused to do so because of the jokes. Now, 27 years later, his second sentence after nice to see you again was, I was offering my mea culpas the other day about those mottos in your book because given the colossal scale of theft in our country these days, it's clear you were right. <laughs> I was astounded. After nearly 30 years, a regime change, and five more books that I had written about Romania, what stood out in his memory of me was those jokes. And despite the many apologies I had made, he was still seeing them as my statement about Romanian character rather than about the book's argument. Thus had I become locked into a marriage of reciprocal disappointment, as my successive books, the fruit of lengthy research projects both during socialism and after, mostly sank like stones in Romanian public life, except for the enthusiasm various university students would uh, express to me on occasion. And none of the potential accolades accorded to other foreigners, such as honorary degrees or election to the Romanian Academy, materialized for me. Nor will they, as long as there is anyone alive who remembers about those jokes. This is the price of my betraying them. The sad irony is that not only did Romanian intellectuals want me to love them, I wanted them to love me too. Notwithstanding my deep and rewarding friendships with numerous Romanian intellectuals, both sides have left this table still hungry. I'm going to end there and uh, entertain your questions. <clears throat> Seventy-three is when I arrived, but seventy-four was broken. Uh, so you were there uh, after 1973 when the July Peace Briefs were mm -hmm. published. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question is, um, in your case time with Vladimir, did they ever comment on what happened before 72? Because 72 is that famous date in, in the mind of many intellectuals that had to do with censorship and division. Um, have they noticed that there was a difference? pleasantly surprised, um, but it was very easy for me to access a lot of files that, as a graduate student from the University of Michigan, I didn't think that I would have a chance to get access to that. You told me you could access it. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, well, I very much appreciate your opening comment. Thank you so much. Um, in 1972, with the uh, July theses, um, which um, indicated a kind of serious whomping up of the ideological aspect of Romanian communism and a reduction of the kind of loose, relatively loose, receptive attitude towards um, connections with the West. Um, and um, I, I would say that my friends 
at the time mostly didn't make that kind of observation, but I've read plenty of literature since then that indicates a, a shift in the Securitate's practices after that. But at the same time, um, there are constant changes in what's going on uh, with the um, Securitate from starting in the early 1970s, so about the time of the July Theses. Um, there was a uh, much increased emphasis on hiring only people with university educations. Now, some of the university educations might have come from the night school uh, university, but they nonetheless had university um, degrees. And um, they began uh, doing personality tests on officers and discovered that approximately half of those who were operatives in the field were psychologically unqualified to be so, and so they were retired into other kinds of positions. So there was a kind of, I would say, a, a push for professionalization in the Securitate um, um, that changed its image from the kind of brutality and um, violence with which it had been associated in the 1950s and, and up to the mid-60s. So, you know, you've got the July theses on the one hand, but then you have these interesting changes with the Securitate on the other. As for how I got my file, um, Gail Kligman and I were writing this book on the collectivization of agriculture. Um, we started it about 2000, and uh, we had a, a whole research team, one member of whom, a historian, suggested that we try to get material from the archive of the secret police. Uh, known as Chenesas in its um, acronym. So we went to Chenesas and we filled out the um, uh, request for permission to uh, study the archive as um, what they call accredited researchers. And we <laughs> gave the title of our project and said this was the kind of material we'd be looking for. And within a couple of days, our permit came back for this kind of work, and we spent um, a couple of two or three weeks each summer uh, for up to about 2006 or seven, um, going there and getting documents for our book. Uh, we got sort of friendly with the staff in the reading room, and uh, one day in 2006, the uh, woman in charge um, was just sitting chatting with me, and she said, why don't you apply for your file? And I said, I had no idea that a foreigner could do that, and I'm not sure I'd want to see what's in it. And she said, sort of, oh, piffle, uh, you know, it, you may not get it. It may take a very long time to come. If you get it, you can decide if you want to read it. So I decided, okay, I'll apply for it. And a year and a half later, I got a letter saying, we have something for you. And when I showed up, um, it was there, uh, 2,781 pages. So I had to buy a new suitcase to take it home. <clears throat> um, but it was, I think that um, um, Gail Kligman has never yet gotten her file. We think that's because there are some powerful people in it who don't want it to come out. But um, uh, we were fortunate in our timing because we, were, we had several very good friends who were on the council of the ch of the archive, and um, they approved our request immediately and proceeded to look for the file. So it was it was easy. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. This is Hi, Scott. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You're almost not sure you should read it, but, uh, but I guess I, I was struck by the, what it struck me as kind of the asymmetry of friendships between East and West during the Cold War. Um, I think people in the East sometimes would look at people in the West of motivation, and sometimes maybe they thought the West was a bit of voyeurism, uh, and they, I think at times, were flattered by someone from the West, you know, a little time in the East to visit. But, but I think from people in the West, there was also, I think, a mistrust about, about why the people in the East were befriending us. Uh, uh, 
were they spying on us? Mm -hmm. uh, did they want something from us, from benevolent, like uh, good coffee and chocolate, <laughs> to in some cases uh, uh, eventually it leads to a request to their marriage for a visa or something like that. So, um, so I think there was often a sense of questioning each other's motivations. And, and what struck me when you're talking about the betrayal and how easy it might go, I, I sometimes had the sense of people in the East were stuck there, but they looked at the people in the West and they thought, well, people in the West always have an escape route. If, if things get too bad and the Stasi or someone else is following them too much, they could always go back. But they were stuck there, so they had a, a much weightier calculation to make every day about the friendship. And in a way, it, you often wondered if that asymmetry meant that the friendship was not quite trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Well, I think those are, are very um, appropriate observations. Um, when I read through my field notes and the I didn't actually keep a daily journal, field journal, um, but my field notes were kind of chatty, <laughs> so they're kind of a little bit like a journal. Um, for the 1970s research, I'm astounded at how little I questioned that. No, I was just like kind of pure id, going out, falling for people, getting to be um, on good, close terms with them. And I wasn't constantly saying, well, what, are, why, what, are they, what do they see is in it for them? I could get to the point of saying, I don't trust this person. But um, it was only um, in later years that I began asking that question. So why is this person wanting to be friendly with me? What is the, how many cigarettes is she going to ask for? Um, and so now I'm afraid I don't remember what your question was, but I, I am quite uh, in uh, accord with the sentiment behind it, that this, these friendships could in no way be symmetrical. And in fact, my, in fact, my friendship with the people I uh, talk about here, the Hellermans, now that is their real name, um, um, they left for Germany in 1988. and. Um, now our friendship is really strong. <laughs> I go there whenever I go to Europe, and they've come here to visit. But yes, um, getting out of there made the asymmetry impossible to, you know, even out the playing field. Let me put it that way. I have three, four people on this front. You didn't. Oh, well, you, but I. Well, if you don't have something, I'll go to Eva. Eva. told that it's going to take quite a while, a year and a half, because they're going to collect it and uh, uh, send me a letter. I got the letter, but I didn't get the full file. And they told me also that uh, not only within Hungary and not only within my field work period, but also in the West, uh, the uh, 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 spying on me or, or observing on me uh, continues. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I found uh, this presentation very touching and uh, very much to my soul. Uh, I also found, uh, found your interpretation uh, very noble, and uh, I think you're taking the high road. You're taking the sort of the American road, and I'm sure I will not be able to do that uh, very noble uh, interpretation and uh, way that you're taking. Thank you very much. Well, that's um, a very interesting thing to say. I haven't thought of myself as noble, but I have, I have <laughs> thought of, um, it's, I think it's partly because I did succeed in uh, talking two of my informers into talking with me about their informing. Um, and we had, had lengthy conversations of, you know, s across several days. And of course, they're, they could be engaged in a massive revision of history. Um, but I tend to be fairly um, persuaded 
by what they had to say about why they were, how, why they let themselves be recruited and what it meant to them to be making these reports. And both of them um, found it absolutely terrible. And they found it terrible from the moment it began. But they didn't think they could say no. Uh, now, this is a very common thing one hears that uh, people say, well, if I'd known that there was somebody else who said no and nothing bad happened to them, I would have said no. Um, and in fact, there were plenty of people who said no, as is apparent from the archives. Uh, the officers have in, the, in their files notes about people who refused to agree. Um, so I, I guess I'm inclined to, first of all, especially in the 1980s, Romania was a terrible place to live. It was terrible for me. It was terrible for them. The surveillance was bad all around. There was, you know, hardly any food in shops. The houses were cold. And I don't feel that I can uh, stand in judgment on somebody whose way of trying to respond to survive in that setting was to say, okay, I'll give a few innocent remarks. And in fact, in the literature on informers, there is, uh, that's a very common way of putting it. Um, I'll just, and my, my own uh, friend who told me about her work for them said, I just figured I would have to be smarter than they were and I would tell them trivia, stuff that didn't matter, and keep the good stuff to myself. Um, but she, of course, didn't know how they would interpret what they heard. So, you know, many people thought they could outsmart the officers. And the officers are incredibly smart. <laughs> they were very smart. So I just, I guess I'd rather, I'd rather take that position. I'd rather try to be generous of people in that situation because I cannot swear to you standing up here that if I had been in their situation, I would have refused. I cannot swear to you that I would have. So under those circumstances, you know, it seems that I, I can't condemn. <laughs> You should also try to get your FBI file. Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, when I was questioned Boyer, by the FBI during, during the Cold War, uh, I was, I was uh, asked about a certain friend of mine, mm -hmm. and I wanted to give the best possible report. And I said to them, "Oh, he loves the United States. He would never do it. No, he doesn't love it that much." <laughs> <laughs> but th then my question is about love. That is. Uh, as a scholar, you know, you, you gain a certain affection for your, for your subject. Mm -hmm. And clearly, I'm not an anthropologist, but some kind of empathy does develop with, your, with the subject, even when you feel it, studying the Soviet Union. Um, at the same time, as a scholar, you have a responsibility to try to tell what we would think is the truth, with all its, its black spots and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. You want to be loved by your subject. At the same time, there's a certain risk at, at trying to do an honest job. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd love you to he hear about the tension because I don't take the American road, I take the Armenian road, mm -hmm. and it's been really troublesome that it's being an Armenian American, writing about Armenia critically, you pay a price for that. And yet, I would like them to like me. My mother mm -hmm. wants them to like me. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, you, how do you negotiate? How do you navigate? Uh-huh. Well, um, the first time around, I um, I wasn't sensitive enough to have been asking myself that question. Um, but I think one of the things that I really love about ethnography as a research method is that we try to use ourselves and our emotions and our involvement in people's lives as tools for greater understanding. And uh, there's a great quote from Margaret Mead from somewhere that I'm going to use in this book. I can't remember exactly what it says, but it's something on the order of the clearest, the truest route to understanding another culture is through the use of one's own emotions if one can only discipline them, <laughs> which I thought was very interesting. So um, going uh, you know, a little bit overboard in uh, my reactions to some of the people that I met, I also learned a, a great deal. I would never have learned as much as I did from this professor if I hadn't loved him. Um, and um, 
But as for telling the truth, you know, I wrote my first book, then I wrote my second book, The National Ideology Under Socialism, um, which, in keeping with um, times, talked about the um, about ethnic and national identity as products of human action. They're not things that were there to begin with. They're not the analogy with biological species. They're human creation. And um, a number of Romanians took ex violent exception to that because they say, you know, our people has been here since time immemorial and we've been screwed by the Hungarians and we've been screwed by the Kumans and the uh, Avars and everybody else. And so, um, they didn't, uh, they didn't necessarily like this book very much at all. Um, but I stand by that book, <laughs> you know, love or not. Um, the position that I took, I will stick with. And so that's my effort at trying to be honest about how I saw um, the uh, Romanian intellectuals that I was writing about caught in um, the sort of crossfire of different um, orientations towards the political uh, system and towards the national idea. Uh, and I think that's a kind of topic that m most Romanians would have trouble writing about, and so I'll do it, and it might not be exactly what they'd want said, but I don't have any trouble with that solution. So I think, and then after that, I didn't publish any books under uh, socialism, but, uh, you know, the system had already changed. Um, I, you know, we do the best we can, I guess is all I can say to that question. But I understand you about the uh, feeling that uh, um, it's very difficult to please the people that you are speaking about uh, when you are deeply engaged with them, in your case, way more than I. Um, I yes. Mm -hmm. Well, my first reaction as you were speaking was my favorite quote from Lily Tomlin's The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe, which is, no matter how cynical you become, it's never enough to keep up. <laughs> um, because, you know, even when I reached the point in the mid-80s of thinking more about surveillance and so on, I had absolutely no idea how much there was. And that was the shock of my file, was finding out this extraordinary degree of it. And um, my friends whom I mentioned, um, um, Hellermans, I gave them, with their you know, eager participation, I gave them the pages from my file that involved their relationship to me. And one of them concerned a trip that we had taken together to another city and for which we had to had tried to outsmart the secret police by setting up a very complicated ruse about how I was going to hitchhike at a, at a specific time from a sp specific location and they were going to pick me up. And so in my file is a detailed description of the officer's tailing of this um, effort of ours to get out of town. <laughs> have some fun without their company. Um, and so my friend Hugo, when he started reading this, he read about one page and he stopped and he, he put his hand like he said, I cannot read anymore, my heart is beating so fast. I had no idea that this is what I was living with. So Romanians too, you know, people, he's of German ethnicity, but was then a, a, um, as when he was living there a Romanian citizen can have this same reaction that I had. 
Um, and I guess what I would do is, um, um, I can send you my, man my manuscript. When are you going? <laughs> Okay, uh, because it has a number of documents in it. If you see the kinds of things that they write, um, that can give you some clues about the possibilities. Uh, and to, I had some Romanian friends who used to, who started socializing me at the very beginning uh, by saying, okay, when you're coming to visit, um, take a taxi or the bus to some other address, two or three blocks from where we live, and then get out and walk to our house. And um, they were the ones who told me the cardinal rule, don't ever mention us to any other Romanian unless you ask us first whether it's OK. And then when the, um, their friends would gather for the Saturday evening party that I would go to, they would turn on the radio extremely loudly to scramble the conversation, which basically meant I could never understand anything either. <laughs> My Romanian wasn't that good. But they were, you know, very explicit about trying to outwit this surveillance. And um, what they did wasn't enough either. But I think uh, you should try to find out however you can from Chinese people before you go, even what are, what's the sort of lore that uh, people there have about surveillance and how to avoid it if, if there is such lore. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I am going to see uh, what uh, Sancho Lodge eventually told us that uh, you use, uh, you, you phrase the word with many passages uh, in terms of betrayal. Does anthropology make a special contribution to our understanding of the terror? It, it is definitely, I think, something that is baked into tragedies. Mm. Maybe there are traitors or people who betray you or something like that. But, um, and from your talk, uh, I think quite uh, correctly, you are coming to a And uh, so I'm wondering whether, to put it in a very abstract way, whether there is an anthropological theory of betrayal, for instance. So what are the conditions? What, what, when, is, <coughs> when can we solicitously betray someone? <laughs> Under what conditions? Uh, and mm -hmm. what is not uh, a betrayal, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't answer that question um, because I haven't um, been, basically I've been trying to write this thing without reading a lot of stuff. And so there may be an anthropology of betrayal, but I don't yet know about it. I did read this book by the Italian sociologist called Betrayal, and her name is so wonderful. It's Turnaturi, and in Romanian, Turnator is an informer. <laughs> so <laughs> she must know something about this. Um, but I think what I, what I um, gained from reading that was this emphasis on the social relationships um, in which people on both sides of a betrayal, possible betrayal, are embedded. And um, her sense of the longevity of the commitment between them as creating the basis for trust. And if you don't have a very long commitment, no matter how good you feel about the other person, it's probably a problem. because. Um, the uh, trust kinds of trusting relationships, that especially as I say in the socialist period, were um, nobody knew who was reporting. I'm not just talking about foreigners, but people in the society too. Uh, so their situation is completely different. You know how they felt about being betrayed. That may explain why this trope of betrayal is so important in Romanian public discourse. Uh, about informers and the sort of very little, I don't know if my Romanian friends here would agree, but rather little emphasis on um, reconciliation, but more on condemnation. So we have three 
Um, a few questions. Gentlemen here, you and you, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the Cohen, but I don't remember <coughs> your first name. David. Okay. David, sorry. Uh, so what I propose, since we're running out of time, is that you state your questions and then you can respond to three of them and conclude. Okay. So please. Well, I have a question. Actually, first, I'd like to repeat Ron's suggestion. You, you send off to your FBI files and your CIA files. Mm -hmm. I did. And they're filled full of the same kind of absurdities mm -hmm. that you found in your Romanian files. Mm -hmm. The only problem is these files are half of them are blacked out. Mm -hmm. You don't see much. All right. Question. Uh, given all this, were you ever kicked out or refused a visa? I don't think you were, were you? No. And if not, why not? Mm -hmm. okay. I say that as someone who was kicked out of an East European socialist country for, um, on the basis of uh, misinterpretation of, of field data. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very touchy subject for you. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I'll, I'll collect these other questions and then. Well, a host of questions come to mind. First, I think you're a very courageous person. That's something that hasn't been mentioned here. But Thank you. You really have stuck your neck out. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Your narrative driven. It's just grabbed grab hold of, of me, and I think I sense that uh, with uh -huh. everyone here. Good. But, Thank uh, you. A couple of, or just three issues. Were there women among the uh, secret police? Uh, who uh, were bullying, uh, essentially, these people into informing on you. Uh, were there other Western scholars with whom you, compare, you could compare notes who were operating in Romania at the time? But uh, substantively, as an act of genuine friendship for persons who had this option, wouldn't it have been appropriate for them to say to you, I can't have any contact with you anymore? because of what I'm being asked to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Let me just clarify your first question. Was it, you said, were there women? Were there, were there women officers? Women officers, yeah. Police. Okay, right. Uh, David? Um, this captain is an amazing piece of writing, and I, I think you've taken us past through this question of Mm -hmm. issue into um, into a question of how pain is experienced in the reading the, the reading you have done mm -hmm. I mean I, I have not experienced a, a presentation of this the pain of reading mm -hmm. has been expressed so eloquently and I, I think you've done it and that, though I I, I, we taught together, you and I taught together in a period where you were just feeling the way intellectuals in the room were, were receiving your, your work positively and mm -hmm. negatively, mm -hmm. uh, which is not an unusual situation for an academic. Right. Uh, but the, the pain of the reading of mm -hmm. 2008 to 2014 takes us into, you know, an Elaine Carey, Rita Dodd. <laughs> I don't really have a question, it's a comment, except that during this period in which uh, you were obviously aware of forming so many important friendships, your colleague at John Hopkins, Sidney Monk, was totally consumed by his trying to understand and then write about his friendship with Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And friendship was in the air in that small and Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He um he invested all of his friendly impulses in that wonderful relationship that he wrote about so movingly in his book Worker and McCain. Okay, well let me um say about uh my FBI file. I have indeed requested it. I haven't asked for a CIA file. I did, I can do that. But I got 16 pages uh, most of which were uh, illegible. There was nothing on them. And uh, they were all, they don't black things out, they white them out. Um, so I plan to put um, on facing pages at the front of the manuscript um, two pages, one from my Romanian file and one from my FBI file. 
Um, the person uh, in anthropology, David Price, who has been working with the FOIA requests uh, um, for studying anthropologists, um, read these 16 pages and he gave me his interpretation, which was that they weren't actually about me particularly. They were following some Romanian who had come to the U.S. and whom they wanted to find out if I knew, um, and then they might have carried on. Um, but I did have a visit from an FBI agent around the time of this, um, uh, this, these pages that went into that file. Um, why wasn't I kicked out? Um, I asked, uh, I asked two of, I, I made contact with three of the secret police officers who figure in my file. And I asked two of them why I hadn't been kicked out. Um, and the first one said, well, he was from Bucharest, and he said, well, those officers in Cluj, they tended to get a little hysterical. Mm -hmm. So they'd send us a recommendation, and we would look at it and say, eh, it doesn't make any sense. The guy from Cluj said, well, cooler heads prevailed, because we realized that we didn't want to jeopardize the American exchanges just because you put some jokes in your book. Um, because the, the exchange programs were extremely important for the Romanians. They were, you know, one theory is that they were busily getting all kinds of technology, stealing in, um, industrial technology, especially computer technology, from their trips to the U.S. And they didn't want to just have the whole thing called off. Now, there were some people who were re refused entry, anthropologists um, of my ilk, but. Uh, they didn't do it to me. And so all I can imagine is that somebody said, eh, you're going a little too far here. <laughs> um, next uh, question about women officers. Um, the uh, total percentages of male and female officers are not yet, it's not possible to say what they are. But I went through a list of about 250 officers whose um, names had been published in this Romanian publication called the Official Monitor. That's where, you know, you are officially labeled a secret police officer. Um, and 10% were women. Um, uh, among, in my own file, there were very few women officers. Um, the one, the people, women who worked for the organization were likely, according to one of my uh, contacts at the archive, to be working in office jobs. They were typists and so on. Um, Western, oh yes, um, com compared to what? <laughs> what is my file like compared to others? Um, I was encouraged to read through a file uh, which has 26 volumes and its label is um, uh, lecturers, researchers, and um, doctoral students from the US. And um, 26 volumes, the first two were about me. And then the whole, all of the other people who'd gone to Romania on exchanges since the late 1960s were in the other 24 volumes. Um, and uh, there was a lot of stuff that was very similar. So the first thing I was interested in is why do they assume I'm a spy? Well, they assumed we were all spies. They really were certain that the Fulbright lecturers were spies. But they uh, assumed that all of us were spies until proven otherwise. Um, and then um, the person, this is the one person who told me ahead of the 1989 revolution <clears throat> uh, that she had in, been informing on me, did it in precisely the way that you suggested. I went one summer, we'd had a very close relationship, 84, 85, 86 when I was there. And then I went in 87 and she didn't want to see me. Um, and so uh, I was baffled by this, but um, I desisted. And then the next year when I went, um, I got word that she did want to see me through um, uh, some friends. And she said to me, I didn't want to see you because I had been asked to write these reports on you, and I just didn't want to have to do it anymore. So it was possible to do that, yeah. Um, then, um, David, uh, yes. Um, one thing I, I want to do with this memoir is not to be pathetic, but to make, to make 
give some sense of the kinds of um, emotional entanglements that field work involves both at the time and afterwards in this kind of reading. Um, um, I, I left out of this the conversation that I had with my friend Silvio on his deathbed uh, in which um, he could hardly speak and I took one look at his wasted form on the bed and I said, no reckoning possible here. <laughs> And I just said, you know, we have been very close friends. We may not see each other again. And I want you to know that I have cared for you very much. And I know you've had problems on my account, and I'm sorry for that. And he um, sort of said, it's over like that. And um, uh, then I said, do you have anything you want to say to me? And he started to speak, but he couldn't really speak. His voice was gone. And so he started, and then he stopped. And I have no idea what he was going to say. And so that was the end of the time, our relationship in this world, anyway. Uh, so th these things really have affected me a lot and made, uh, and they're having a tremendous, um, re re tremendous reverberations on my feelings about my relationship to Romania. There, I've begun settling down a little bit now, but for a while I just, I didn't even want to go back. I was so mad. I just didn't want to have anything to do with the place, and that I don't feel that way now. Thank you very much for your attentive responses.